Hi, this is Freddie Spencer, and I'm actually here in Rome um, at a motorcycle show, Moto Days, this weekend. And I'm coming to you first time this year uh, in the first podcast after the one I did with Matt Oxley. But this one is uh, following the Qatar test, so we got the three, three tests, all the preseason testing wrapped up, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But first, I want to finish up the questions that we didn't get to in the podcast in the little talk that Matt and I had. So let's get right to it. Uh, first one is from me, Emmy. Uh, what was your favorite racing number? He always liked my number 19, and also any plans to visit Coda this year, obviously, uh, that circuit of the Americas in Austin. First, about the racing number. My racing number, actually, uh, 19, comes from, um, it was a number after my brother, who ran 18, my older brother, my only brother, Danny, uh, who was 11 years older than me, and, and he raced when we were kids. I actually used 17 first, and then he used 18, and then um, I used 19, and how that came about is my first uh, a couple years as a professional, when I was 16 and 17, he was number eight. And actually, um, in my first year as Superbike with American Honda, he was number eight. And then after that, I changed. And I kind of wanted to go back and, and maybe use 17, but I didn't really want to use that or my brother's number. So that's how I came to 19, and I, I just liked the way it looked. And so I used number 19. Um, any plans to visit Coda this year? No. Uh, I was thinking maybe going to the circuit for the Grand Prix, but I can't. I have classic events over here that I'm I'm doing. I'd, I would love to go there. I've never been there before, and I'd love to go there. Uh, actually, my, my kids go to the to the Grand Prix and because uh, they, they live in the Houston area, and so it'd be nice someday. Next, uh, Nia Swan. Freddie, did you slide the front on purpose uh, or just a byproduct of pushing so hard? Combination of things. He's talking about... The front on, there's a great photo that um, Stan Perrick uh, did from 1983, and it shows me pushing the front on my three-cylinder, and I always get asked question, did, was that on the way down? Were you crashing? No. The three-cylinder, because of, at that time, the way the bikes were designed, the geometry, very flat, a lot of steering and rake, and, and just inherently uh, the way a motorcycle works, that when you're pushing on the edge, the front end will have a tendency to tuck. I could anticipate that and, and use the throttle to bring it out of it. And with my rear wheel steering the way that I did, I actually, it, it helped me make that transition from corner entry to getting the bike in position to accelerate a lot shorter amount of time. So a lot of the front end pushing, yes, I did it not only because I was pushing hard, but on purpose. Uh, Sachiro forever. Uh, would, fast, would I, would me, uh, be able to lap a circuit within a half second off the fast time of a modern day race on equal machinery, given that the electronics didn't do, would that help that? I'll give you a real world example. I was doing the product launch for the, for the Fireblade last year in 2017 in January, and we were at Portimao, and I was there for six days, and it was, um, so I had a chance to ride every single day, and there were some other, other riders there, GP guys and we would ride together. And pushing hard with the blip and throttle, not using the clutch, just being able to bang a downshift, certainly made it easier on corner entry for me to run at that pace, which I don't really anymore. And the pace, you know, a higher speed, pushing hard. The same thing with leaning on the front straightaway there with the electronics um, and under hard acceleration, I could run a lot higher speed, and the electronics certainly help anticipate the slide. And, and if you don't do it, even if you're not an older rider like myself riding against younger riders, it helps you because it compensates. Electronics, comp they compensate in, in areas when you're on the edge or they certainly help in recovery when you're doing lap after lap after lap after lap and make the bike just a little bit easier. So you don't have to be quite as much let's say compared to like a 500, we're just coming through a high speed sweeper. If you just a little too much throttle, that thing would snap around. So being on top of it and, and anticipating that, um, you'd have to be right on and ahead of it. So it certainly, certainly helps. I'm not gonna say it give me within a half second of someone, 
but it certainly helps in, in being able to, to run a higher pace when you don't do it anymore. So, or if you get a little bit older. Um, Porcupine asked Finales or Zarco. If you ask me after the first three races in 2017, which I talked about on the podcast many times, I would have said certainly Vinales. And But now, I wouldn't say that. I would have to say Zarco stepped it up this last year, gained the experience, believes and knows he should be there. He's a past world champion in Moto2. He's going to be tough, and he's not intimidated by anybody. And he's more emotionally kind of in it week in and week out. He's more methodical. And, and you know, emotion is, is a great thing. As long as it doesn't interfere and in, in you've been able to be consistently in the game every lap, every race, even when you struggle. Because when it's going well, it's easier. But when you're struggling, you got to have that, that emotional kind of stability to be able to compartmentalize and be able to just, just to focus on the, getting the job done and everything and, and, and knowing how to use both, both of it. Andrew, uh, our POM, during the first hours of the Burham test, uh, the Thailand test, all riders had discovered along the track. It seems many of them were given a look backwards at each corner exit during that learning period. I saw videos of Marquez Ross, Rossi Smith doing that. Can you explain why they do that looking backwards? Well, in a situation where you're learning the racetrack, one is you look back for a couple reasons. One, it, it, it depends on your pace. If you're not running the higher pace, you're looking back, making sure you're getting out of out of someone's way. And I know I, I would do that for that reason. It's respect and, and you certainly uh, would want someone to do that for you. Another reason why if you are quick and you do feel like you have a good life, you're kind of looking back making sure no one is following you and, and you're giving them a toe. A lot of the guys you can see, you see that certainly in Moto3 for different reasons. In Moto3, it's, it's the guys who look back trying to get a toe because it certainly makes the bike faster. And MotoGP, it's, it's, if you're quick, you maybe don't want someone following you and, and picking up on what you're doing. So there's a, there's a couple of reasons, but majority of the time you see it, uh, in practice specifically, it's, it's, you're, you're being respectful, making sure you're getting, getting offline or you're getting out of the way. Andre Saranoff, I've seen reports that KTM program and, and premier class costs around 250 million, for f million euros for five years. Is that accurate? Not, not so sure if that's accurate, but if so, how big is that budget for Mo and how, MotoGP and how much for rival factories spend a year? Well, you know, I, I'm sure 25, 30 million euros is, is, a, is a common yearly budget and probably more, to, or it could be a little bit less, depending on how much you're having to develop a new bike or make a new bike, but it certainly is, is a lot of money is being spent. And the reason why is, is these are unique bike prototypes, one-off, and they depend on a lot of outside vendors. I know even Honda does. HRC doesn't manufacture, and Honda does all, those, all the parts for the Grand Prix bikes. Some of that is, is, is out to other vendors, and it's not cheap. Patricia, uh, Patricia Fisher-Tolman, um, last question here is, also is this, this for me, why do you think there's not much interest in MotoGP in the U.S.? It really bums, her, bums, them, bums them out. Uh, is there, just because it doesn't seem like there's many fans in the U.S., I know they used to have races, obviously, Andy Laguna besides Austin, and, um, and then the problems with the Austin Tarmac. Just basically, you know, they, she, they are, are concerned and don't understand why American football, basketball, baseball, all the major sports are so much more popular than Grand Prix. And, it, and I've dealt with that my whole life. You know, coming from Louisiana, I'm the only person in motorcycles in the Louisiana State Hall of Fame. I've always been the outside sport, and it's always been frustrating because I know how much our sport matters here in Europe and, and the popularity and, and really just the great sport that it is, the great people involved and, and the, the ingenuity and the creativity of, of the equipment. There's so many things that, that make it special. But you got to understand in the United States, the major sports are individual and they're, they're major athletics and they, they're understood. They're, they're played at the basic level, you know, high school level. And in, in high school and the exposure and the understanding is so much greater. And unfortunately, in our sport, it's just not the case. But we know how special it is. 
Well, that, that's all the questions, and, and I look forward to asking, answering more uh, the next time. Now let's move on to, real briefly, just a little bit about each, each manufacturer and, and the improvements that I've seen in the winter testing. One, the Honda. I would have to say Mark Marquez certainly is going to be the favorite leading to um, the first race in, um, in a couple of weeks in Qatar. And part of the reason is, is not only the fact of four out of five world championships he's won in the last five years, but the fact that I really believe they've improved the engine performance of the, of the Honda engine, more acceleration, and then allow the electronics to be able to control that as needed. It's, you know, with electronics, I mean, I'd, I'd be the same way. I'd want as much power as I could and then manage it with, with electronics and my own abilities. So I would have to say that consistent laps that he, run, he ran, he didn't run the quickest lap in the test, but he certainly had an extremely good pace in the long runs, and that's what's going to count at the end of the day on Sunday. Now, Dovey on the Ducati. Um, I would have to say that he's going to be strong again. He certainly picked up where he left off. It seemed like the, he likes some of the improvements with the 2018 bike, but I, I'm not sure how much it's improved yet, and we won't know until we get through Qatar, because the Qatar should be a good track for the Ducati as it always is, but it's going to be where we'll see as, as we get through the first five or six races exactly where they are. But he's confident, and that's a great thing, and I think it's going to be certainly him and uh, Mark will be the two kind of measuring sticks as we get started. You know, into the first four or five races, we'll kind of have an idea. His teammate, Jorge Lorenzo, what a great lap he put in at Seabang. But since then, he's definitely struggled. Not sure about uh, if the 18 bike, he went back to the 17 bike to compare, and that's not a good sign for him. So we'll have to see where his head is once we get the, rate, the season started. The Yamal team, wow, you know, it's you you would think that all the characteristics of the M1 seems to be struggling. Once they've went to the Michelins uh, and and then consistency they're 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 experiencing with the grip level and the longevity of the Michelin tires performance over an entire race distance, and just in their head, you know, they, they seem to be really struggling. Uh, uh, getting that figured out and both of them Maverick and Valentino are struggling with that you know now that Valentino looks like he's going to ride you know a couple certainly a couple more years and uh, you know can kind of push that aside Maverick's already got his contract signed let's hope that they can get that figured out and and be there on Sunday afternoons like like we hope um, Suzuki is very impressive what they've done. Alex Renz certainly in, in, in testing, but one lap, let's see what happens over the length of the race, and let's hope that Inoni gets his act together and, and gets it going. One little thing about uh, you know the other Honda guys is that a good indication of the improvement they've made so far is Cal Crutchlow, uh, Nakagami, and certain Morbidelli um, improved, and, and that's, that bodes well for them. Um, as the season gets started. And of course, Danny's going to be right there. Everyone else, um, we'll have to see where KTM is and them, and we'll talk about that after the first race in Qatar. So I hope to see you then.